Hello everyone and namaste to you. I hope you can hear me clearly. So we will start today with Samyama on Prana. We did verse 3.39 the last time. I will recap since that was related to Prana. We are doing this section, Samyama on Prana, and verse 39 said that when we have knowledge of pranic channels, the mind can enter into another body. Now verse 39 and verse 40 are related. Verse 39 talks about entering another body, while verse 40 talks about leaving the body at will. It's obvious that if you can have knowledge of pranic channels and you are can enter into another body, you obviously have to know how to leave your own body consciously. So verse 40 says, by conquering ud udana, that is the upward moving prana, contact with water, mire and thorns is avoided and the exit from the body at will is assured. The upward moving prana, udana, is generally the pranic energy that travels towards the Sahasrara chakra, to the highest chakra. And when this is mastered, it means that the practitioner can leave the body at will. There are scriptures that has, have interpreted this in, in a very different manner. They talk about um, levitation and this idea of avoiding contact with water, myra, thorns, uh, they interpret in terms of levitation. What it does mean is that when the body, when the, when the practitioner can leave the body at will, he has full control over the pranic energy. That means that such a yogi can live outside the body. There have been examples or instances of yogis who have taken what is called Jala Samadhi. They enter water, the river or lake, and they are able to stay at the bottom of that lake or river for many hours. There have also been instances of yogis being buried underground or in caves. A well-documented example of this was during the times of the British Raj in India, during the colonial times, when the soldiers, the British army, the soldiers would witness such um, amazing feats. One well-documented feat took place in northern India where a yogi entered into uh, an underground um, cave and the, the, the army posted soldiers there so as to see that there's this, this yogi is not coming out and he was removed from there one year later well and alive. This is documented and as I, if I remember correctly it is in the Museum of War in London and it makes you wonder how that is possible. That that is possible if the mind of the yogi is not in the body at all. Or is not, the body is underwater or 
is buried underground or in a cave, it doesn't matter because the mind is not there in it. And possibly the yogi has taken another body altogether. Now this sounds all very incredible, but with the knowledge of the pranic channels, this is possible. Verse 41, by conquering Samana Prana, mastery with the gastric fire is assured. Samana is that prana which is related to the ability to digest. It's related to the Manipura chakra, the third chakra. Now, according to Ayurveda, almost 99% of disease begin with poor digestion. They begin from the stomach. Manipura chakra is also the largest chakra in the body. It's the largest network of pranic channels in the body. And when this is unblocked and open, this prana is moving freely, then it assures mastery over the gastric fire. There have been instances of yogis who can digest almost anything. There is a story of Neem Karoli Baba, who was a well-known yogi in North India, who had, who would eat up to 40 meals a day. He would go to his students and they would all feed him. And he would go from student to student and would be fed by all of them. Anybody else would have fallen sick, but he was able to digest all that. So very strong pranic fire is able to digest that. So that was samana or absorption or concentration on the pranas or the vayus. Any questions about that? I'm well aware that this is not very easy to, to understand or to believe. These are supernormal powers. They are Siddhis. And we need to purify our minds and have a few glimpses and experiences so that we can relate to these. The average person cannot relate to this and that what we cannot relate to or cannot understand we call powers or miracles. Next comes the group of verses on Bhutas. Bhutas are the elements. You may recall five basic elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. And this group of verses is talking about concentration on these elements. By performing samana, samyama on the relationship between akash, that is space, and the ear, a divine sense of hearing is acquired. Akash very often is translated as sky. Colloquially in Hindi and other Indian languages, that is exactly true. It is sky. But here it is used as a technical term. And akash means space. Everything that we are doing right now, if you look around you, the walls of the house or wherever you are, the, the chair you're sitting on or the sofa, everything around you is located in space. You are located in space. And that is akasha. 
Understanding the relationship between space and hearing brings about a divine sense of hearing. What is this divine sense? Divine is the word that's used over there, but it means subtle, that which is subtle, which is internal. And what this means is that you hear the divine or subtle sounds within, known as nada. Nada are these internal sounds. When you can hear the divine sounds within or the internal sounds, it's a sign of progress, but you should not get distracted by these sounds, but continue to practice as guided by the teacher. There are many different kinds of sounds one can hear within. And some of the sounds are merely distraction. There is nada itself, anahat nada, unstruck sound, which is om. And that sound you hear in deep meditation, it's not just a sound, it's a vibration. And when you hear Anahat Nala, it will shake you up. It will shake up everything. It's a very, very strong vibration. So powerful that you, you may not even be able to integrate it or bear it. It's... Like a vibration, I would like to explain this. For example, when a very fast train goes through the station, you are standing on the platform, it creates a vibration around it. It's very powerful, this vibration. You know, it creates an air tunnel. And so you instinctively move back. You can't be too close, close there. And that's the kind of powerful vibration you feel when you hear Anahat Nada. It's very powerful. Verse 43. By practicing Samyama on the relationship between the body and Akasha and by concentration on the lightness of cotton wool, Passage through Akasha can be secured. So by absorption on the relationship between the body and Akasha, once again, that's space. So you know your body exists in space. It moves in space. So that is one aspect. What is meant by concentration on lightness of cotton wool? The way it is actually explained in Sanskrit, it's difficult to translate. But cotton down is produced from cotton wool in a process of dispersion. In India earlier, and perhaps even today, this used to be a common process that mattresses were, were produced in this way. Often the person came home and created it there itself. So you made a mattress <laughs> out of cotton wool in a process of dispersion. And then you looked at it, you saw there was the cotton wool would sort of disperse. It was flimsy. And so a thick cotton suddenly was made very thin, very light. What does that mean? To disperse. The body seems to disperse. And this is referring to what some people have called astral traveling. In some legends or um, stories, like in the autobiography of a yogi, um, it seems that the yogi was appearing in almost in two places at uh, the same time. 
or he was traveling, um, you know, from one place to another in a form of dispersing and then coming together again. And by understanding the relationship between body and space, this is possible. Once again, it's um, something we maybe do not understand. We can relate to it perhaps with, the, with these examples, but these are unbelievable siddhis. Verse 44. The incredible state of mind held externally unconnected with the body is called Mahavidya. By Samyama on it, the covering over the light of buddhi is removed. What happens? Just imagine that you would leave your body and would be able to observe it like an observer from outside. Observe your own body. Even when you try to imagine it, it's very difficult. But if you could imagine it, then what would happen is a very, very powerful realization that I am not the body. When the mind can become an observer and observe the body itself externally, then it's very clear that you are not the body. He experiences, the practitioner experiences the body as an object. This helps us decrease our attachment to the body. And through this practice, the light of buddhi is sharpened or uncovered. So when you start seeing very clearly that you are not the body, not as an, an intellectual idea that you tell yourself or repeat to yourself, but a real insight, a realization, when that happens, it's a big sign of progress. Any questions so far? Verse 45. Mastery over the five bhutas or elements is acquired by Samyama on their qualities. There are five basic qualities. One is its gross nature. So if you take earth, for example, anything that's hard, an object, let's take a pot, for example, or a table or a chair, that's the gross aspect. Svarupa, that's the essential nature. Sukshma, the subtle aspect. Anvaya, that's the inherent order. And Artha, the purpose. So when we see the world around us, you see this gross aspect of it. When you understand its true nature, that it's actually all consciousness, you begin to also understand its subtle aspect. The subtle aspect is in the mind, it's internal. We have an idea of what the world is. If you have a lot of problems in your life, then the world looks like a terrible place. But if you are happy, things are going well, the world suddenly looks like a wonderful place. In reality, there is consciousness. It's neither good nor bad. When this 
is clear to you that there's internal, external way of looking at it. There's also its essential nature. You begin to understand the inherent order. The order we have often looked at when we have seen our diagram, which we can have a look at. And we say, this is the inherent order of the world around us. There are objects in the world. They are gross. The body is also gross. The breath is a little bit subtler. The mind is still subtler. Active and latent unconscious mind is even subtler than that. And then we come to the center of consciousness. And we know that this all is consciousness as well as this is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. The inherent order is going in this direction, outward, and in meditation, in the opposite direction, inward. And so there's a certain order. And then, finally, we come to the purpose. And this is the purpose, here, center of consciousness. To know the center of consciousness, to be a witness, and to serve the witness is the purpose. When we understand this, that's a big step. Having understood these three aspects means you really have mastery. The three aspects as in waking, dreaming, deep sleep, or from the perspective of the Yoga Sutras, the five qualities, which is the gross aspect, the essential nature, the subtle aspect, the inherent order, and the purpose of existence. When we have understood this entire system, this yogic anatomy, and not just merely as an intellectually understanding it, that when we have seen it for ourselves, direct perception to see darshan, yoga darshan, when we have seen it through meditation and acquired mastery in this, you have really power over the Buddhas. What does this mean? You really have abilities to do things that others might consider to be a miracle, but for you it's just totally normal because you see things differently. I often talk about this example that a little child tries to steal some sweets or candy, climbs up to the kitchen, and the mother sees the child and says, I can see you, I know what you're doing. You're trying to steal the, the, the sweets and the child can't see the mother and is amazed. How does mother know? In reality, the mother has maybe seen the reflection of the child in the mirror or reflection in the window. And mother says, oh yes, I have powers. When you become a mother, you will also have powers. And so we are like children. We do not understand this, how this is possible. But as we purify our mind, ahankara is polished, manas is well-trained. The unconscious mind is purified. Buddhi gets sharper. Then... All these things come naturally. Verse 3.46 Hence develop the powers of anima and other supernormal powers as well as perfection of the body. 
there's no more resistance to the body by the bhutas. Now, anima is just one of the powers. There are eight supernormal powers called Mahasiddhis, becoming small, becoming large, becoming heavy, etc. Um, these are aspired to by some tantric uh, practitioners who do black magic. Sort of, uh, it's it's tantra has two aspects. One is the I would say the darker side where they double in superstitious things and uh, powers. The other aspect is that of self-realization. So when you have mastery with the Buddhas, the five elements, you really understand the world, you have understood the process that goes inwards as well as outwards, you acquire many superpowers as well as perfection of the body. Now, it is not necessary that these powers will come as you get a full insight into the process. But it is possible that they will come. But for those who are only interested in self-realization, they, they may not have these powers. The reason is that it says it is acquired by samyama. That means you have to invest time and energy into acquiring these powers. If you put time and energy into powers, it is clear that self-realization, becoming a witness and being established in that, will become secondary and you will remain at the level of the mind still. As you know, we have done this in the previous sutras. To attain self-realization, you need to do samyama on the self, on pure consciousness. And if you spend your time dabbling with powers, then you, you get powers. You don't get self-realization. Self-realization is complete freedom from suffering, from pain and suffering. While powers may be nice to have, but they do not help you be liberated and be free from all pain and suffering. Verse 3.47 says, Beauty, grace, strength and firmness make up the perfect body. What does that mean? Does it mean that having acquired mastery over the elements, understanding this entire process, inward as well as outward, suddenly will make you beautiful and strong? The body is a reflection or manifestation of our samskaras. If we go back to the diagram, it is our samskaras that are stored here, which lead us to eventually acquire a body and the body you get depends on these samskaras which are in the active and latent unconscious mind. If you have animal tendencies, for example, you will acquire an animal body. If you have human tendencies, you will acquire a human body. Therefore, it's the karma and the samskaras which determine the kind of body you have. People having diseases, distortions of the body, 
these also come from active and latent unconscious mind. These are our samskaras. When you start purifying the latent, active, unconscious mind, there is a change in the aura, there is a change in the personality, and the body chemistry itself changes. Disease comes from negative habit patterns, negative mental and behavioral habit patterns. When we resolve these, when these habits are unlearned, then disease itself disappears. A lot of people start practicing yoga because they have sickness or disease. And the yoga they are practicing is at a physical level. And yes, at a physical level, asanas do help. But so does any other form of exercise. You can do some sort of gymnastics, you can do pilates, you can go jogging, you can go for a brisk walk every morning. All of these help. So asanas will not cure your disease. Regulated lifestyle in terms of food, etc. will help as well. May not necessarily cure the disease from the root. The only thing that will really cure the disease from the root is the removal of the root itself and the root is in the mind. So the active and latent unconscious mind, these are called samskaras or seeds. And when these seeds are destroyed, burned in the fire of knowledge, the entire body changes, disease starts disappearing. Great health comes to the practitioner. It's not like the facial features are going to change and you're suddenly going to be you know, Miss Universe or something in your looks. But definitely you will have a different aura, a very attractive quality about you because within you, you feel beautiful. That ugliness, the ugliness is these negative mental thinking patterns or behavioral patterns. These disappear. What shines through is the beauty from the center of consciousness. And people feel that around you. That's why all the great sages, uh, spiritual leaders have always been portrayed with a beautiful aura, a light around their head. They've also been portrayed, all of them looking very beautiful, very kind, gentle, and not necessarily very masculine or feminine, but a nice blend of masculine and feminine because they're balanced. So it's like a charismatic quality, an attractive quality of love, which flows through and shines through. And so, to go back to the document, it says, Beauty, grace, strength, and firmness make up the perfect body. So you acquire total physical health. You become graceful, even strong. Have a firm body. Not this flabby kind of body, but a very firm body. So this is a, a nice uh, siddhi to have. Good health, that's always very nice. Any questions about this? The next group of two verses, 
3.48 and 3.49 are about the indriyas, the senses. By samyama, on the cognitive ability, the real nature, the sense of identity, the inherent order and purpose, mastery over the sense organs can be acquired. So, this samyama has two translations or two meanings. The first one is absorption, really deep concentration. And that's the technical term which we are using and have been using all along. It's made up of dharna, dhyana and samadhi. But samyama also is used in a colloquial sense to mean mastery. So sama means complete and yama means control. It means complete control is mastery. So by absorbing or having a deep concentration on the cognitive ability, the true nature, the identity, the purpose, all these, you acquire mastery over the sense objects. We can go back to our diagram and see the cognitive aspect is referring to buddhi. The asmita, the sense of identity is here, this one. The inherent order, you already know that, that this is the order here in this way, as well as that way. And this is the purpose here. So if you know buddhi, if you have access to buddhi, that's the voice of wisdom in you. You have really achieved a lot if you have that. If you know your essential nature, that is true consciousness, that's pure consciousness, that's already wonderful. You have understood here and experienced the limitations of the asmita or hankara here, that's the limitation. You have understood all of that. The purpose, the this is mastery. We already referred to it in the earlier verse in a slightly different manner, but all the same similar manner. That this mastery leads also to mastery of the senses which are here. Now this is different from control or discipline of senses. So if you have a desire for chocolate or ice cream and you say, oh no, it's not a good idea. I should not have chocolate. I just had some or not too much ice cream. That's discipline. That's control. That's imposed upon you by your own conscious mind or hankara or it has been you're convinced yourself through the voice of wisdom that this is not true mastery. True mastery is much deeper. True mastery comes when you are a witness and you see everything and the senses are obedient and they serve the center of consciousness. They are no longer unruly and untrained doing whatever they want, they, they're obedient. So what happens then? So verse 49 is related to Verse 48, it says, Thence comes quickness of the mind, independent, independent of the body, and mastery over Pradhan, the primordial cause. This 
Now, when you have complete mastery over the senses and the senses serve the body, the body is, loses its importance. The mind becomes very quick. The buddhi becomes very sharp. The awareness has expanded. So such a person can make very quick decisions. He is not bound by limitations of the body or by various aspects which are creating tamas, like asmita, for example, the sense of identity that would create some limiting factors. But that will not happen because you have now acquired full mastery over the entire process. This leads to mastery over Pradhan. What is Pradhan? Pradhan is all the Bhutas, the phenomenal world. You can use the objects of the world without being attached to them. These objects do not have any more power over you. You merely see them as objects and nothing else. There is no ego involved anymore. This mind has very, very sharp buddhi. The voice of wisdom is very sharp. It sees through everything, cuts through everything. So this is also a wonderful superpower to have, supernormal power. It's the quickness of the mind, very sharp, very fast. Any questions on this? I'm quite aware that these are very esoteric and deep subjects. So if you have no questions and you're just listening and letting this sink in, that's also very nice. We come to the next group of verses, that is 50 to 52, and these are very important ones, especially verse 50, very important verse. We can see that now we are coming almost to the end of chapter 3, almost to the end of superpowers. We are heading towards chapter 4, which is called Kaivalya, Total Liberation. So we are coming now to those parts of the spiritual evolution where we talk about liberation. Only from awareness of the distinction between Buddhi Sattva and Purusha rises supremacy over all states of mind and knowledge of everything. Buddhi or Sattva is the same thing. It's the most sattvic aspect in you, Buddhi, the voice of wisdom. And Purusha is another word for the center of consciousness. Now, while we have said buddhi sattva. Just want to clarify that buddhi is not always sattvic. Not everybody has a sattvic buddhi because buddhi, the state of buddhi depends on the state of the mind. If the mind is tamasic, dark, then the buddhi is also dark. It cannot see through a tamasic mind. Similarly, rajasic buddhi means the mind is rajasic. Such a buddhi cannot see clearly through the mind. But a uh, sattvic buddhi can. It's very sharp because the mind has been purified to some extent. Now when this happens, this buddhi becomes very sharp. 
because of purification of the mind. It appears to the practitioner to be, be Purusha. It, it appears almost like pure consciousness. It has a certain quality. But remember that buddhi is in the mind. It is not pure consciousness. It is only the closest aspect. It's very, very close to pure consciousness. It's, it's purely sattvic, so it's, it's almost like pure consciousness. But pure consciousness is not a part of these gunas, tamas, rajas and sattva. It is beyond that. So when such a person now understands this, that buddhi, through direct experience, is not the ultimate goal. There's awareness now that there is something beyond it. And very clearly, it is purusha, it's the witness. Then such a one acquires knowledge of all the states of the mind and knowledge of everything. How is that possible to become omniscient? So buddhi is somewhere here in the conscious mind. And when this keeps expanding and expanding, the mind has been purified, it gets sharper, sees things clearly. And then suddenly one day it says, it, buddhi is looking sort of backwards now, and looks and says, oh, oh, what is this thing here? This is pure consciousness. And suddenly it recognizes and says, oh, I am in fact the center of consciousness. It's a big moment of truth. And what has happened through the process of expansion here? You have full knowledge or complete knowledge of both the active and latent unconscious mind. You also have complete knowledge over the macrocosm. This is microcosm here, what you see. But there are also planes of consciousness at this level, which are the macrocosm. So you begin get insights into that as well. Because your buddhi is very sharp, you also see the world completely different. You expanded your awareness to basically include everything because now you're established here. And you know everything. This knowing is not in terms of information. A witness may not necessarily know the day India won its freedom from colonial powers. It doesn't know the date. No, it doesn't mean that suddenly you know all those history dates that you know you studied in school and never really remembered. It's wisdom to learn to live in the world, to know things that others may not see so clearly. It tells, teaches us how to live happily, how to make decisions, how to be healthy, how to be dynamic, creative, live fearlessly. This is the omniscience that was talked about here, knowledge of everything. It gives you access to intuition, higher intuition, which means that such a person might even know things about the future or about distant things, merely by concentrating on that. Some people have these psychic abilities, they know that, because somehow they have trained their Voice of wisdom, their buddhi, a little bit, and they're able to do that. 
that does not mean that they are self-realized. So, but the self-realized one can do these things. He doesn't have to do it. He may he doesn't want to do it. He may not want to misuse his powers because that might mean that he will fall. So this is an important verse here. It is the cornerstone of liberation that pure consciousness, purusha, is different from buddhi or the most sattvic aspect within ourselves. Two different things. They may not appear to be very different to somebody who is just beginning to practice and coming in touch with the different states of the mind. But it is very different. It's like a quantum leap. That is why that state of the pure witness or pure consciousness is also known as the fourth. It is not a state like waking, dreaming, sleeping. It's simply called Turiya, the fourth. It is very useful to sharpen buddhi, even though buddhi is not the goal, buddhi is a very good instrument. In traditional scriptures, one says that use a thorn to remove a thorn. So if you hurt yourself with a thorn, you know, a thorn pokes you on your foot or your hand or whatever, you have a little thorn inside. And you can't really remove it with your nail or it's a little bit deeper. Then you take another thorn and you sort of dig it out. So you use a thorn to remove a thorn. Similarly, you use your mind to go beyond the mind. And so, what kind of mind do you want to have? A mind that is your friend or a mind that is your foe, your enemy? Well, obviously. You want a mind that is your friend. A good mind will work towards liberation. A well-coordinated, one-pointed mind with a sharp buddhi. So what do we do? What are the methods to sharpen buddhi? Sharpen buddhi means basically to clear the mind and purify it. So internal dialogue is one of them. Prayer is a very very nice one. Prayer does not mean mindlessly parroting prayers that have been, you know, um, made, written in scriptures. But prayer here means that which rises spontaneously in you, a call for liberation, a call for guidance call for strength, a call to have a one-pointed mind. And that rises spontaneously. That's the most powerful prayer. Other ways are through meditation, systematic superconscious meditation, and regulating lifestyle. That is regulation of food, sleep, sexual energies, and self-preservation. Regulating our lifestyle will not be the final solution, but it is definitely a very important foundation so that we can expand our awareness. Verse 51, and by non-attachment to even that siddhi, the very seeds of bondage are destroyed, leading to Kevalya. So, omniscience, knowledge of everything, and having full mastery over the mind, is the siddhi now, which is being referred to, by non-attachment to omniscience, 
the very seeds of bondage are destroyed. Now, omniscience sounds really good. It's a superpower that I think everybody would like to have. It makes the buddhi very sharp, and you can do things that others will just be amazed about. The mind becomes so good that you... It can lead to pride. It can lead to arrogance. That would be the downfall, because that brings us back to hankara. But if it is possible for you to remain non-attached, even to omniscience, then the very seeds of bondage are destroyed. That means full knowledge of the mind is retained. All the samskaras are burned in the fire of knowledge and that leads to complete liberation, Kaivalya. This is just another word for supreme non-attachment, Param Vairagya, which was mentioned in chapter 1, I think it was verse 16. And when one is able to remain unattached, that is a very... Um, advanced state, but you're still not free completely because there can be still a downfall when, as verse 52 says, invitations by celestial beings should not be accepted, nor should it cause attachment and pride, since this would lead to the revival of undesirable consequences. So there's still possibility of a downfall. It's still possible that you end up again in that state of the mind, not beyond the mind, but in the mind still, because of pride, because of arrogance, and because of giving into temptation. We talked about the levels of the mind, waking, dreaming, sleeping. Deep sleep. I also said that was at the microcosmic level. But at the macrocosm level, there are planes of consciousness. There are disembodied beings. And when we die, if you're not liberated, imagine it like this. You go to bed one night and you don't wake up. You start dreaming. And then you... In your dream, while you're dreaming, you die. You remain, basically, in that state. It's like dreaming, only now you don't have a body. And most people remain unaware. It's like the dreams at night. You don't know what you dreamt of most of the time. It's very rare that you remember a dream. So that is what these planes are. These planes are... Basically, dreaming in deep sleep, but disembodied form. Now, the beings that are in this planes, when they see somebody enters here consciously in the body form, but is entering this plane fully aware, they are very happy. And it's a very beautiful world. This celestial world, celestial plane, heavenly plane, has been described in many scriptures. And it's a very sensual plane, actually, because it's like a beautiful dream. You know, it has beautiful light and a very nice feeling. When you have a good dream, you get up in the morning and you, you had a nice dream. And you may narrate it to your friend or your family and say, oh, that was such a lovely dream. So it's very similar, or rather it is the same, that these beings in these planes come and say, oh, you're wonderful, you know, and they tempt you with, with all this sensory pleasures. 
In Indian mythology, they talk very often about apsaras, uh, celestial damsels. And when the yogis were able to access this, this plane, while still in the body, through meditation, these celestial damsels would tempt them. And uh, the damsels are merely a symbol. It doesn't have to be a damsel, <laughs> a woman, a beautiful uh, woman, but uh, very beautiful beings. That's in the Western Christian sense, it is angels. They're very beautiful. And uh, these are heavenly planes, basically. And these... It's a wonderful temptation to stay there, but if you would do that, you would still remain in within the three worlds. And eventually you would take a body again. Then your samskaras at that plane are have been worked out. So you see, it's not a good idea to expect to accept the invitations of celestial beings. Be aware that you have to go beyond that to be really and truly free. Any questions before we end our session today? It's actually a good place to stop. The next group of verses is liberation. And with that, we then will come also into chapter four on liberation. So it gets very exciting and interesting. The next sessions. I'm assuming that there are no questions about this. And we can end our session for today. I hope you all enjoyed. And have a nice weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, Perry. Bye, Sylvie. Debbie. Bye-bye. Bye, Rati Fedri. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Manisha. Bye, Nita. Bye, Jenny.